when a boat suddenly capsizes. A boat's going down! Everybody off! Skipper Steve Conway and four young crew are left stranded in the Gulf of Mexico. I'm not dying in here! I was terrified beyond belief. Floating aimlessly without a life raft, they face exposure, hypothermia, and the threat of drowning. Travis! Steve must draw on every ounce of his experience to keep the four young men alive. You've got to have a fierce will to live. as hard as you can. I can't do it! I can't do it! Oh my God, what is that? Swim! Skipper Steve Conway and the crew of the Cynthia Woods are preparing to set sail on an epic boat race. Hey, um, where do you want me to put this food? Behind the stove. Steve is a vastly experienced sailor, a Coast Guard commander for 21 years. He has a lifelong love of the ocean. Ross? Yeah? You got that hanyard connected? Yeah, it's all done. When people get around the ocean, one or two things happen. They fall in love with the ocean or they fall out of love with the ocean. And, and I can't really explain why it happens, but for a number of us who go out on the water, there's just uh, an affinity, a feel for it that's like nothing else. Uh, where do you want the clothes? Down in the drawers. Steve's young crew today is a team of students from Texas A&M University. Make sure that everything's secured. I was real confident of the boat and the crew were experienced young men who'd been sailing for a number of years and it was looking to be a really great race. Hey, Steve. Hey. Is that it? Yeah, we're getting there. His right-hand man on board is a young sailor he's known for three years, 22-year-old Travis Wright. I'd been sailing with Steve for three years at that point. An excellent sailor and a very safe person, but very experienced and definitely the leading presence on the boat. He was definitely fully in command. As Steve bids his wife goodbye, he's all too aware of the responsibility he has for his young crew. All right, Travis, can you do the stern line? I was designated skipper of the vessel, and as such, the skipper is ultimately responsible for everything. It's not a responsibility that you take lightly, and it's not a responsibility you can walk away from. For over three months, the crew have trained together in preparation for the 630-mile race from Galveston, Texas, to Vera Cruz, Mexico. Almost there. A little bit more. The feel of the wind and the sound of the wind through the rigging and the feel of the boat in the waves is just almost addictive. They sail six miles out of the harbor and Boat Safety Officer Roger Stone counts them down to the start of the race. What time is it now, Roger? Okay, 20 seconds, 20, 20 seconds. 20 seconds, gentlemen. 20 seconds. Roger was a very experienced sailor, very experienced racer, a really great coach, just a great way of explaining to the young men and women what to do and how to do it. We're coming up to the line. Getting ready. 10 seconds, 10 seconds, guys. Three, two, yeah, we go! There we go! All right! They soon break away from the other boats and head out into the high seas of the Mexican Gulf. Let's keep it pointed 180 degrees due south. Steve Guy is the least experienced sailor on board and is relishing the chance to take part in a big ocean race. 
Travis was sitting next to me showing me kind of how to do things and... Doing good. I felt pretty good, you know, I'm in control of this boat and it's just kind of a power rush because you're like, here I am on the open ocean doing what I love to do. Enjoying yourself, Steve? Oh yeah. <laughs> Everyone was ready to go, but you could also tell we were also in that competitive mood of we're, you know, we're wanting to do this right. Here's a way to see how fast we're going. See? Adjust the sail and see how we go faster. Okay. As the race gets underway, the crew are in high spirits and excited by the challenge ahead. Doing good. Yeah. For over six hours, the Cynthia Woods makes superb progress. Everything was going great. The sun set, the moon was up, and I realized about two hours into the watch that I hadn't even got wet yet. And the first wave hadn't even splashed over and splashed me, which was unheard of to be out that long and not get splashed and get wet. So it was just an absolutely beautiful night. Hey, Joe. Yeah? You want to do the uh, topping lift a bit tighter? OK. As dusk falls on their first night at sea, Two of the young students rigged the sails for the night's racing. Ross, you're gonna have to wake him soon. Yeah, okay. Below deck, Travis, Roger, and Steve Guy try to get some sleep before taking over for the night watch. It wasn't my time to go on deck yet. I just decided, okay, I'll get up, I'll get something to eat, I'll go you know, shoot the breeze with the guys on deck and see what's up and start getting settled in. That's when it all started going downhill. Finding water inside the cabin is not unusual, but Travis instinctively suspects something is badly wrong. I opened up the floorboard and it just came pouring in. Roger! Roger! We got water! We're taking on water! Hey, Steve! Steve! What's going on? We're taking on water! Start the engine! It's every sailor's worst nightmare. The boat's hull has a serious leak. Due to a previous incident, the keel, the huge balancing weight at the bottom of the boat, has cracked along its mount. Joe, get ready to douse the sails. OK. Skipper Steve knows that they're in terrible trouble, and they must drop the sails to slow down. But before the guys can get the sails down, the keel of the vessel parted completely, came off, and the boat went instantly into the water. The boat just laid over into the water, just completely horizontal. All of a sudden, the lights go out. The engine shuts off. What happened? I don't know. Up on deck, Skipper Steve is clinging to the capsized boat. I was hanging underneath the boat because it wasn't still up out of the water at that point, thinking it was time to go. A boat's going down! Everybody off! Unclip yourselves! In just a matter of seconds, the boat has completely overturned. Steve and the two students on deck escape the sinking boat. Come on, guys. Hey, oh, did you see anybody? No. 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 But Roger, Travis, and Steve Guy are trapped inside. And seawater is flooding in. Yeah, I screamed it, I'm not dying in here. This is not where I'm gonna die. 
Unless they can find a way out of the cabin, they are just seconds from being dragged to the bottom of the ocean. Emotion's telling you at that point, you're screwed. I mean, there is no way out of a situation like this. The water level is rising rapidly. Unless they can get out, they're just seconds from being dragged down with the sinking boat. How do we get out of here? Through the hatch! Their only escape route is a tiny hatch, but a powerful wall of seawater is pouring through it. Are you kidding? Come on, it's the only way! I'm sitting there thinking to myself, how am I going to swim through here? I don't even think an Olympic swimmer could actually get through this with all the water rushing through. Let me try. Let me try. I can't do it. I can't do it. We couldn't even hope to match the flow. I was hoping to grab the sides of it and force my way out. But the first time I tried that, it blew me right back. Steve Conway can do nothing but wait for the three men to emerge. I didn't really know what was going on down below, but my biggest concern was that Roger, Steve Guy, and Travis weren't able to get out of the vessel and drown. Gotta get out of here, man. What are we gonna do? I was terrified beyond belief. I don't even want to see what my face looked like at that point. Take a deep breath. Go for it. I'll push you through. It's your only chance. As I was trying to go down the second time, Roger grabbed my legs and pushed. The six crew are now out of the boat, but there is still one man missing. They wait. But Roger Stone fails to appear. Nobody knew what happened to Roger. Nobody had seen him come out the other side. We didn't know if Roger was in the boat or if Roger was floating off in a different direction. Should we go back and get him? What do you think, Steve? No. I would have never let anybody go back in. In the situation we're in with all the lines out and underwater, there was no real chance that somebody would be able to dive underneath, get in there. I could have gone inside the boat with absolutely no lighting whatsoever, felt my way around and never found him, even if he was in there, because there's too many nooks and crannies in that place and I would have had to do it all on one breath of air. He's an experienced yachtsman. He'll be fine. Yeah. He'll stay with the boat. The crew now have to focus on their own survival. Steve Guy has escaped the boat with no life jacket. Canvas! Canvas! Go to the boat! OK! Get the ring! We'll go! Okay. Skipper Steve sends the crew back to the boat to get the emergency flotation ring. 
It was very crucial. We already knew that Stephen didn't have a life jacket. If he had the horseshoe ring, he'd have something to float with. The guys have only moments to grab it before the boat sinks, but it's tangled in a web of matted ropes. Releasing the ring is an impossible task with their life jackets on. Take off your jackets! Do whatever you can, but keep your jackets on! Ah, okay. Wait. Skipper Steve and the young student are being dragged away in the current. He knows he must take immediate action. At this point, there's a couple of major things you try to do. The first thing you try to do is stay with the boat. The second thing you try to do is stay together. So in this case, Steve and I couldn't swim back to the boat. So I decided that it would be better for us to stay together. Also, I wasn't sure that my flotation was enough for both Steve and I. Guys, wait. Come here. Skipper Steve orders the guys to abandon the flotation ring. Steve decides their best option is to tie themselves together so that no one can drift off into the vast ocean alone. Tie onto this. Got it? Anything we could to make sure that Steve, uh, guy, was not going to come loose. Or if he did, he would be just a tug of weight. And then we locked arms and legs to try and preserve heat. I mean, it's probably the most awkward position you can imagine as far as five guys together but it is what we had to do. As their boat sinks in front of them, all they can do is pray for rescue. But in the dead of night and 60 miles out at sea, nobody knows they're missing. Our chances of getting out of this mess are less than 10% easy. The Cynthia Woods sank in just a matter of moments. And with it, all of their emergency equipment is gone. The only thing you've got is the people that are with you and the clothes on your back. The crew had no time to raise the alarm, so no search party will be called out until dawn. Steve Conway knows that if his student crew are to survive the night, he will have to draw on all his years of experience as a skipper. Until you walk back ashore, you're still the skipper. And I was very conscious and focused on making sure that everybody was OK. We're going to be fine. We stay together. We'll be fine. But adrift in the vast ocean, they'll have to survive in one of the most challenging environments on Earth. During the first night, the immediate thought process, conserve your energy. You don't know how long you're going to be in the water. You don't know when somebody will show up to rescue. <laughs> About every three to five minutes, the water would blow up our nose, no matter what we did, how we turned from the wave action. And you'd gag it up, spit it out curse for a minute, and about three to five minutes later, it'd happen again. Try not to swallow the water. I can't help it. <laughs> Seawater contains three times more salt than human blood. It's so concentrated that swallowing just a mere pint can cause kidney failure and death. You did not swallow salt water at all. You get that stuff in you, and it'll kill you. I'm starving. Really? 
Yeah, when I get out of here, I'm gonna have the biggest feast. <laughs> <laughs> we were just kind of talking, you know, saying, kind of joking around, you know, so what are you gonna do when you get rescued, you know? Oh man, my parents are gonna be mad when they find out we're here. Steve was like, well, don't get in between me and the bar because that's where I'm gonna be when I get picked up. A beer is the first thing I'm gonna have yeah. when we get out of here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Joe, you still got your shoes on? Everybody else lost their shoes except Joseph, who had a brand new pair of Nikes. Nothing's gonna take my shoes from me. <laughs> <laughs> Steve and his men are completely alone in the vast ocean. Hey, guys, I can see something. Is that a boat? On the horizon, they spot something that gives them a glimmer of hope. Hey! Oh! 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 Hey! Oh! Yeah, we're 60 miles off the coast of Texas. We are outside the shipping lanes already. Our best possible chance of rescue at this point in time is going to be a fishing boat that happens to be out here. Save your energy. They're not going to hear you. Wait, this might work. They do everything they can to catch the boat's attention. Hopes were really high, hoping that maybe someone on the deck would be like, oh, what's that little light flashing out there, and tell someone on the bridge what was going on. But that didn't happen. Even if we do see somebody and trigger, you know, any of the signaling devices we have, we all have whistles on our vests and lights and that kind of stuff, there is a very slim to none chance that they're going to see us and recognize us as people in distress. But the boat fails to see them. Shoot! I'll be at this. I will. I'll be at this. As the night wears on, their thoughts turn to their missing comrade. Who do you think Roger is? Probably on the life raft, chugging a beer. <laughs> Do you think he's okay? He'll be fine. He's an experienced yachtsman. He knows what to do. I think all of us kind of kept a hope that he did get out. I mean, kind of deep down, there was that, well, maybe he didn't but it was always the positive that always came out. At this point, we weren't talking too much. You know, that kind of died off. We just kind of sat there and did our thing, stared off into space. About 3.30 in the morning, I remember thinking, we're floating along, we're all lashed together, four to six foot waves, and thinking that I really ought to be on a boat about 10 miles farther south sailing. It was almost dreamlike and surreal. As they drift on the ocean current, Steve Guy spots something on the horizon. Did you see that? It's one of the many unmanned oil rigs dotted around the Mexican Gulf. And for young Steve, an obvious way out of the ordeal. To me, there it was. And we're getting pushed down to it. It almost seemed like we were circling around it, like someone upstairs was saying, hey, look, guys, there's a platform for you. I thought it was worth trying to swim towards the platform. You think we could swim there? It's about seven miles away. How can you tell? Well, when you're in the ocean, the line of the horizon is about seven or eight miles away. And distance isn't the only problem. So I have to realize that that structure 
is a hundred and something feet over the water. And if you, if you, even if you swim to it, how do you get out of the water? What do we do when we get there, huh? How do we get on it? Travis was the student skipper and sort of second after me, so he was the he was my rock that I that I stuck with as far as any kind of discussion about what should we do? Should we try to swim? Should we do this or that? We'd be swimming against the wind. We use up all our energy, and for what? It was kind of disheartening when the decision was made to just kind of drift past it. Skipper Steve makes the decision to conserve their energy. They're now pinning all their hopes on rescuers finding them. But even staying put is no guarantee of safety. The Mexican Gulf is a shark-infested body of water. Big sharks. Those are the ones you worry about. Tigers are probably the most risky. They get really large. And it's not long before Steve's worst fears are realized. I saw a triangular fin go by. None of the other guys saw it. Desperate. To ensure the young crew stay calm, Steve keeps the sighting to himself. I'm certainly not going to say something that's going to unnecessarily concern them. If there's something they need to know, I was sharing it with them. But they didn't need to know it, and they didn't need to know it. there was a sense of relief as the sun rose. I remember thinking, OK, it's light. And just psychologically, I think the light was, was reassuring. We could see more of what was around us, less risk of something surprising us, certainly. And with the morning light comes the hope that a search will soon be launched. What's going to happen is this. I started walking the students through what would happen. We had a normal 8 o'clock call in on our satellite radio. Every morning at 8 o'clock, I called in and said, here's where we're at, we're OK, and just did a daily check-in. About 8 o'clock, they'll start listening for us. I figure about 8.15, they'll call the Coast Guard. So uh, when, when do you think they'll send out a search? Well, I figure about 10 o'clock, we'll see the first planes. What if they don't find us? Will they, will they stop searching? Oh, not for a long time yet, buddy. I figure about eight to 10 days. This kind of a search, you just keep it up long past there's any chance of people surviving, actually. But dawn also brings with it the intense heat of the morning sun. The sun was out, none of us had caps on. Fairly quickly, we started to burn. My god, it was hot as heck. It felt like being in a sauna. We were just boiling. By midday, it's been 13 hours since the boat sank but there's still no sign of rescue. We should be seeing something. We should be seeing, you know, planes or hearing planes fly over, even, in, even at a distance. I was getting to the point where we were all very tired. Steve Conway knows he must keep his crew focused. On the horizon is the oil rig, the same one they saw the previous night. Let's swim for the rig. 
hope you'd agree that that was a dumb idea. Well, I changed my mind. With the wind behind us, I think we can make it. Only hours earlier, they'd rejected swimming to the rig because it was just too far away. Huh. Having dismissed the exact same thing, probably 12 hours ago, I clearly thought that rig was a good idea. It gave us a focus, it gave us an objective, it, it gave us a sense that we were doing something beyond just floating to help ourselves. The life jackets were very much starting to chafe on us and starting to really rub parts of our skin raw. So I, at one point, stripped out of mine and gave it to Steven. I gotta get Steve my jacket. Oh. oh, thank you, Travis. Uh. The men swim for over two hours. But they're making almost no progress towards the rig. And the effort is draining. Oh. It was the dumbest thing I can think of possibly doing in retrospect, because I was thinking that rig was probably about five, 10 miles away, but my perspective significantly skewed at that point. The energy expenditure of trying to swim against the waves and against the wind, you're not gonna get very far for the amount of energy that you're gonna put out. Despite their desperately slow progress, the crew struggles on towards the rig. <coughs> but exhaustion is not their only enemy. We saw a Portuguese man of war, which is a jellyfish. Behind them will run anywhere from 20, 30, 50, 60 feet of tentacles stretched out with stingers on them. The long, deadly tentacles are filled with venom. As long as you stay away from them, you're fine. But you get stung by one of them, and you're dead. <laughs> Saw him drifting toward us. We knew we had to swim quickly. Swim harder! Come on, faster! Come on, come on. They finally escape the deadly jellyfish, but they've pushed themselves to the limit. Getting to the rig now is impossible. Exhausted and dehydrated, they're forced to abandon their attempt. They've now been in the water for over 14 hours, and the ordeal is starting to take a terrible physical toll. By about two o'clock, it had been roughly 24 hours since I had last had any kind of food or drink, and I figured everybody else was in the same position, fairly dehydrated from being out there in the water and sweating it all out all day. The human body can survive 48 hours without water. But with the sun beating down and their skin exposed to salt water, the crew are succumbing rapidly to extreme dehydration. One of the big hazards of being in salt water is dehydration, which sounds totally backwards. You know, you're floating in the water and you're becoming dehydrated. Our fingers were just puckered up and just totally, you know, dried up. Finally, by mid-afternoon, 
the authorities have detected a signal from the sunken boat's transponder, and a full rescue attempt is underway. The helicopter arrived late that afternoon, and we actually saw it hovering out off in the distance. After withstanding 14 hours out in the ocean, it seems that their ordeal is about to end. But the five men have been dragged by ocean currents, and they are now miles from the sunken boat. They can do nothing but watch helplessly as the search plays out in the distance. We could see them the whole time. They just couldn't see us. It builds you up, and then it crushes you. Oh, God, there it is. You know, this could be the one, and then it's not. They're never going to find us. I just kind of snapped at that point. Shut up, Travis. Just shut up, OK? They're going to find us. We're going to get out of here. And it just sent me over the edge. It's like, how can you even think like that right now? You've got four other people here that all they need to hear are positive thoughts, not your negative thoughts, you know? He's right. It's pointless. The men now believe their hope of rescue is gone. And with the second night fast approaching, they fear death will take them one by one. It was so late at that point that we all kind of were probably thinking the same thing. It's, you know, they haven't seen us yet. We're not doing well at all. Somebody's going to be going pretty soon. Come on. Come on, guys. Joe, come here. Come on. Travis, come here. Come on. Close come, on. come on. In together. That's it. Good. Come on. We stay together. Right? A whole day with no protection against the blazing sun, has pushed the crew to the edge. The lower portion of my stomach was burned. My arms were burned, my legs were burned, and my face was burned. I wanted the burn to go away. Dear God, did I don't want the burn to go away. As the sun drops, the temperature plummets and the fight to stay cool turns into a battle to keep warm. It was getting to the point where we were all very tired. I think I probably blacked out for a few seconds every now and then. Come on. Sorry. Sorry. With light fading, the rescue helicopters begin to disappear over the horizon. And Skipper Steve drops a bombshell. Guys. We may not see another helicopter until tomorrow morning. Are you kidding? There's no way we can last another night. I was deathly afraid of the impact of the young men I was with dying on their families to be in any way responsible for somebody, a parent, losing a child. I couldn't imagine. 
Let me tell you uh, about a case study that I read. A fishing boat overturned. And uh, a very fit 22-year-old football player died. But a 68-year-old grandmother survived. How come? Afterwards, they interviewed the grandmother and uh, they asked, how was it your grandson, who was so much fitter, died? And she goes, I wasn't going to give up. I wasn't going to die. You've got to have a fierce will to live. You've just got to never give up. The will to survive is the most critical thing for us to make it through. We must never give up, OK? Never giving up was the critical thing for our survival. But the will to live isn't enough to protect the crew from the effects of severe hypothermia. Your core temperature starts to fall. Once it gets below 95 degrees, down to around 90 degrees, you die. Uh, you just go to sleep. It's not especially traumatic. You just fall asleep and don't wake up. Joe started going in and out of it because he kind of, I guess he fell asleep. He started reaching over and started grabbing Ross's face. Uh, Joe, hey Joe, what are you doing? So, so, sorry. Ross, the smallest of the group, is beginning to drift in and out of consciousness. Ross was in the worst situation because the rest of us are fairly big guys. Ross had zero body fat. So he had no insulation like the rest of us. And it was noticeably affecting him more. He wasn't talking at this point. Skipper Steve has done all he can to keep his crew alive. But after nearly 20 hours in the sea, he too is now fading fast. We'd all been out in the water the same amount of time. The bigger guys would have probably lasted an hour, maybe two more. But if Steve was going, we didn't have much more time either. The five sailors have now been in the ocean for over 24 hours. They've done everything they can to withstand their ordeal. But they're losing the battle to survive. You know, in the dark, it's kind of depressing. Just this vast expanse of ocean. I felt really small, you know. Here you are, you feel like a grain of sand in the world. They've suffered acute exposure to the sun. Extreme dehydration and hypothermia. And are now just hours from death. Nobody was saying, oh my god, they're not going to find us, oh my god, you know, we're going to die out here. Nobody has vo had vocalized it. But we all kind of were probably thinking the same thing. Steve Conway has done all he can to keep his young crew alive. But now he knows that with no sign of rescue, his quest to survive has failed. I was scared of what the impact would be on my wife. We'd been married at that point, uh, 30 years, and we we're best friends and still very, very close. We've seen other people lose spouses, and it's hard. In no heroic way at all, but just matter-of-factly, as I was floating in the water, I realized I wasn't afraid to die. Drifting in and out of consciousness, the five men can now do nothing more but await death's final call.
then, out in the darkness, comes the sight they've been dreaming of. Then all of a sudden, every light on that helicopter came on. The rescue search hadn't been abandoned for the night. The Coast Guard had tracked the ocean currents, which eventually led them to the missing crew. Everyone just screamed it. I'm happy, you know, we're going home. It all really set in that it's finally done, it's finally over. You know, we're getting out of this and we're getting out of it alive. The five men were airlifted to the hospital, and they all made a complete recovery. But when the Coast Guard finally salvaged the sunken Cynthia Woods, they found the body of missing crew member, Roger Stone. Nothing we say or nothing we can do can honor Roger more than his actions of the 6th of June 2008 when he stopped got those two students oriented out through the flowing water, out of the boat, ultimately at the, the risk and sacrifice of his own life. And so it's never appropriate to talk about this without recognizing Roger's sacrifice and the sacrifice of his wife and two children. I would not have made it without Roger's help. I do think about Roger. And when I do, it makes me want to go live my life to the fullest possible way, because life's short, and I realize that floating out there. The only thing I decided to do different when I got back was that I was going to savor things more. Not the big things, but the little things. Over Christmas, I was holding my grandson probably for the 14,000 times. And I stopped for a minute, and I thought, this is just wonderful. And my takeaway message as I hold him and have my, my daughters and my wife around me is life is wonderful. You just have to savor it. And that's what I'm doing different. 